Hey, hello, and welcome to Stan the Energy Man here. Coming to you live from Honolulu, Hawaii on the 8th of March, 2019, and then on YouTube forever and ever and ever and ever. Got a, an interesting, different kind of show today that's kind of focused specifically on something that's near and dear to the folks that live here in Hawaii, the ocean, and using energy technology that's never been used on the ocean before. And so to start off, I'd kind of like to talk to you just a little bit about, about boats in general, for those of you that don't know much about designing boats. And most people don't realize this, but I've actually built several um, boats for the ocean, including ocean-going canoes and uh, an ocean-going power catamaran and a 33-foot um, fishing boat vessel that's designed for the ocean. And I actually have a picture of that vessel. That's the first image I have, so we'll throw that one up on the screen. This is a, a boat I designed and I built. It's plywood and epoxy. Um, I couldn't find any of the construction of photos of it in my office. I have them all at home. But um, just some, some things to think about. When you, when you think about a boat or anything that goes on the ocean, it's a lot different than transportation on the land for several reasons. Number one, um, transporting things on the land, you don't have a whole lot of resistance in air. I mean, there's some, certainly, but nothing like the ocean. For example, when I'm driving that 33-foot boat and I'm, I'm doing 10 or 12 knots and I pull the throttle to idle, the boat comes almost to a stop within a few feet. It, it just stops almost instantly because that non-compressible water is a little bit more work to push through than, than a car going through air on a level surface. So it's, it's different. Things in the water are different. So that boat, for example, is extremely fuel efficient. And it, it's extremely fuel efficient because it's got a long, narrow hull. It's um, got a very steep entry. It's kind of got a, a large, a tall bow and a, what we call a sponson to help knock down some of the um, waves and spray that, that hit it. So the, the boat is actually fairly dry. It has a very low center of gravity so that it stays really stable in the ocean. Um, and it actually gets extremely good um, fuel economy. But when I tell you extremely good, you're going to go, that doesn't sound so good, Stan. That boat burns two, gallon, two and a half gallons an hour of gasoline at 10 knots. And you, you might say, oh, okay, well, that's like five miles per gallon. So you, you're, you're like, holy mackerel, that's, you're only doing 10, 10 15 miles an hour, and, and, you're, and you're getting five miles per gallon in a car. That would be terrible. But that's just some of the differences you have when you're dealing with maritime applications for energy and um, terrestrial, you know, transportation on the ground. or in the, And in the air, you have a whole different set. Um, in boats, a lot of times you want the boat to be heavy, um, especially to keep it stable and to keep it driving through that non-compressible water. But in most transportation, the heavier the vehicle, the, the more fuel you need to push it through whatever you're driving through. So there's no perfect boat, there's no perfect airplane, and there's no perfect car that does everything. You can't have a super fast boat or a super fast car that doesn't give you other problems like pounding itself to death in, in heavy waves or getting lousy fuel economy. So there's always compromises in design. And today's guest we have uh, with us is uh, Dr. Joel Pratt. Um, I met him when he worked at Sandia National Labs, and we're gonna talk about a couple of the projects that, that he worked on while he was at Sandia. And then we're gonna talk to him uh, about a project he's got going now, uh, where he started up a, a new company that's doing hydrogen fuel cell technology in the maritime world. So Joel, uh, welcome to the show. I appreciate you coming on. Hey, Stan, it's great to be back. Thanks yeah. a lot for having me. Yeah, we'll have to do this more often, especially as your, uh, your, your uh, ferry boat gets into uh, a more solid state and gets into use. But I'm going to throw up a slide here that's uh, one of the first projects that, that Joel did. It's a, it looks like a pretty plain container, a nice pretty blue container. But what this project was, and I'll, I'll let Joe describe it, it, it was a project at Sandia Labs done in conjunction with Young Brothers Hawaii, a local barge company here, where... They put, I believe it was a 100 kilowatt fuel cell and some storage tanks in a container to provide electricity for refrigerated containers on the barges that go between Oahu and Maui. And so, Joel, could you tell us, Joe, could you tell us a little bit about, uh, number one, yourself, and then let's get into that, that, that container and the specifics of that thing. Yeah, sure, Stan. Um, so, a little, so a little bit about me to, before we get into that project. Um, I started working on hydrogen fuel cells or looking at them, uh, actually looking at this the other day, go back more than 20 years when I was an undergraduate 
And uh, one of my first projects at Fuel Cells was looking at um, fuel cell tour boats at Crater Lake National Park. So I think I can legitimately say I've been working on hydrogen fuel cells in marine for more than 20 years, although <laughs> a little, a few gaps in the middle there. Um, I, I attended uh, graduate school at the University of California, Irvine, studied at the National Fuel Cell Research Center, went to work at Sandia National Laboratories, focusing on applications of fuel cells, hydrogen storage systems, and uh, spent about half my time actually working on hydrogen fueling stations for vehicles, um, and the other half was really focused on maritime. So through all that work, looking at the uh, landscape out there, the use case for hydrogen fuel cells in maritime, and the demand that was actually pretty surprising um, going through these projects, decided last January to leave Sandia and start this new company, Golden Gate Zero Emission Marine, which provides hydrogen fuel cell powertrains for all types of boats and ships. That's a quick background, Stan. Great. And how about the project with uh, Young Brothers? Give us a little, little bit, short blip, blip on that, because actually you were on my show probably two years ago and, uh, and talked about that, but get everybody up to speed that wasn't familiar with that project. Well, Dan, so if I was on your show talking about it, then everybody already knows about it, because everybody <laughs> watches your show. <laughs> I wish. Um, yeah, that was a great project. <laughs> that was a great project. It, like you said, 100 kilowatt fuel cell, um, fuel cell in a box, we called it. So it had the fuel cell and the hydrogen all together, powering reefers. Um, it, I don't know if you know this, it actually won a Department of Energy award for outstanding advancement of hydrogen and fuel cell technology in the early market through the world's first peer side maritime fuel cell power system. That I was in 2016. Know that. We got that award. Congratulations. Yep. So um, it, it was a well, it, it was a team effort. You know, the the whole project involved, as you said, Young Brothers, um, uh, uh, American Bureau of Shipping, Hydrogenics. Mm -hmm. H it, yeah, I was getting there. <laughs> HNEI, HCAT. Um, really a team effort. I was just kind of putting everything together, but all the work was done by everybody else. So we got that fuel cell working on the dock. We got it. Um, that was the first exposure the Coast Guard had with hydrogen and really getting them up to speed on what it is and, and how to use it safely um, next to the water and even getting into on the water. So uh, it was, uh, I think, a real landmark project, and, um, you know, DOE even recognized that. Yeah, and it's really, you know, people have to understand that, you know, this technology is is not new. Hydrogen fuel cells have been around for decades and decades, but bringing them into the marketplace and putting them into applications is new to firefighters and Coast Guard and a lot of other folks. So that project with the, uh, the um, maritime fuel cell was an eye-opener for uh, Coast Guard folks that attended the training that we gave and um, the firefighters that attended the training that was put on by, uh, what was it, Northwest National Labs um, and um, some yep. of the stuff that we demonstrated. Um, so people have a different appreciation. A lot of the uh, stereotypes for hydrogen went out the door when they got their training. So that was, you're right, that's, that's a real great project because it, it broke the ice for a lot of people who had no idea what a fuel cell was and how it would work. And then later on in... Uh, you know, one of the oh, interesting... Go ahead. Oh, sorry, Stan. Um, I was just going to say, w one of the real poignant um, parts that came out of that project was um, one, of the, uh, one of the workers at Young Brothers, when it first got there, they said, oh, I don't want a hydrogen bomb on the dock. Yeah. I said, okay, you know, what, what are the concerns? And so we talked through them and showed him the system and really got into the details there and all the different safety checks and everything. And by the end of the project, he was the, our biggest advocate. You know, this technology is great. We no longer need to bring imported oil in here. We can make our own hydrogen and, and power everything with it. And in terms of safety, it's safety upon safety upon safety. It's, it's never going to have any problems. So uh, that, that was an example of just the kind of um, outreach effect that I guess that project had, which was as important as anything technologically that we did. I think you're right. You can't overstate the the learning curve that we that are in the industry and understand hydrogen kind of take it for granted because we know it. But there's some real fears out there in the community, most of them not well-founded in fact, 
Um, and when they finally get to learn about hydrogen and see the equipment and, and use it, hands on, touch it and use it, um, they're, they're, their thoughts change and they're, they're really pretty surprised. The firefighters especially are, by the time they finish the firefighting training, virtually every single one of them that we've ever dealt with, whether it was for vehicles or for your project, say, hey, we'd rather deal with hydrogen than, than regular gasoline or propane or just about anything else. And I know in the maritime industry, there's, there's a lot of diesel use. And um, in the bigger ships, bunker fuel, but in, in smaller vessels, a lot of diesel engines for a couple of reasons. They're really reliable, they last a long time, um, and the fuel is relatively inexpensive still, um, but it also is not as flammable as gasoline or other fuels. So a lot of the boats like diesel because the one thing you don't want on any boat is a fire. A fire is like the biggest, right. scariest thing you can have on any kind of vessel, even if it's made of steel. You don't want fires on board boats. So Hydrogen, when you first talk to maritime people about hydrogen, the first thing they do is look at a Hindenburg picture and, and freak out and say, I don't want that on my boat. But the advantages of hydrogen, and, and we'll talk about this when we get to your ferry, is you, your hydrogen, if it ever escapes its tanks or whatever, is going to go straight up in the air at 45 miles an hour and not accumulate, you know, and we, we design the boats and stuff so that hydrogen won't accumulate any place where it could be a, a detriment on board or a cause for fire. So um, the second project I, I have an a, uh, image for is the um, Scripps Institute um, vessel that you worked on with some other folks at Sandia, or at least Sandia worked on and, and you're familiar with. Um, could we throw that slide up? It's the blue, yeah, that one. It's the zero, uh, zero V. And this is a like a, I would call it a trimaran or a high speed hull that um, is really popular with the military right now. Believe it or not, the army has this style hull in some of their high-speed inner island um, vessels that they use out here. And uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit about uh, the vessel? In fact, uh, I'm looking at the image right now. I know you can't see it, but the one thing it has uh, liquid hydrogen um, tanks on the top of the boat. And can you talk about that concept a little bit and the safety aspects of doing it that way? Yeah, sure. So this boat was a, a, a next step. Um, there was a boat in between this one and uh, the container project that was a small ferry that was operating in San Francisco Bay, a study. And then we wanted to see, could we use hydrogen to power a bigger vessel and one that had a longer range, uh, multiple days. So this vessel, if it ran from Scripps in San Diego, um, could make it all the way to Hawaii um, with a single fill up of hydrogen in San Diego. And that, um, that's about 2,400 nautical miles, I right. think. It had a 3,000-mile range. So we were able to show that you can build a vessel that has much longer range and endurance than um, just a small ferry. It can be an ocean-going vessel. It have all the sea-keeping properties. Um, and in this case, the tanks are up on the deck. That's one of the reasons we have a trimaran here, to give it a little bit more stability. Uh, rather than a monohull, which most research vessels are. Um, so the, the trimaran gives us some space down in the hole and also uh, stability to have things up on deck. Um, the Coast Guard and the, the International Maritime Organization regulations don't prohibit putting hydrogen down in the holes. Um, so we could have done that. It's basically following in the footsteps of what uh, LNG, how they use LNG today, they put that down in the holes of cruise ships and other vessels. Um, and so they, we, we can follow the same path, but in terms of, um, as you mentioned, safety, if hydrogen leaks, it goes straight up in the air and having it on open deck simplifies some of the safety systems that right. we put on board. And that was liquid hydrogen on that vessel, correct? So it's a little bit more dense and heavier than than the hydro compressed hydrogen that we have in cylinders. So it has some weight to it, but I guess putting it up high didn't make it um, a destabilizing factor on a trimaran as much as it would on a monohull or if it was raised way up high on a higher deck. Yeah, that's right. Um, and then one of the interesting things about this vessel is the, re the researchers love the concept of it because you're really taking advantage of a lot of the properties of hydrogen fuel cells. Um, and they're doing a lot of measurements out there 
uh, sonar measurements, air quality, um, water measurements. You know, they bring up organisms from in the ocean. And when you have a power plant that doesn't emit any pollution, the only exhaust is water, um, you're not worried about sample contamination. Um, you're not worried about noise from your engine interfering with your sonar measurements. And um, uh, you can even use the water coming out of the fuel cell, the deionized water, for your experiments. So they, they really love this vessel from a research perspective, um, not just an environmental one. Yeah, and if you have a, <clears throat> it's got a really clean electric signal when it comes out of a fuel cell versus a spinning generator. So that there's a good quality there, too. But we're going to take a quick break here, yep. Joe, and uh, we've got 60 seconds. We'll be back to talk to you some more about uh, your current project. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that you know may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Aloha and welcome to At The Crossroads. I'm your host, Keisha King. I'm live at five every Wednesday, where we have entertaining and educational conversations that are real and relevant, both here in Hawaii and across the globe. I'll see you at the crossroads. Aloha. Hey, welcome back to Stan Energy Man. Stan Osterman here, talking to Joe Pratt, um, PhD uh, researcher that used to work at Sandia National Labs and now is on his own doing maritime fuel cells. And uh, we were talking about some of the vessels he worked on and projects he worked with at Sandia, including um, the next image that I had um, to throw up on the screen is that intermediate ferry that, um, that he talked about in San Francisco. So this was kind of the, uh, the step between some of their other projects and, and that stationary fuel cell and then the big research vessel they were doing for Scripps. And it's really a really handsome boat. And what I, I kind of wanted to stay on, on this image a little bit to talk about something else that, that runs parallel to what we do whenever we're doing energy savings or, or clean energy projects. Like before you put solar on your house, you need to really make your house as energy efficient as possible. In other words, you seal up the, the leaks um, from your air conditioning so that you're not pushing cold air outside. You insulate the house properly so that you're not heating uh, your house too much when it's cold outside or, or cooling your house, spending too much energy on cooling um, because you're efficiently insulating your house. And then, you know, so you always go for the efficiency first. And when it comes to maritime, uh, the ancient Hawaiians and ancient Polynesians had it right. Um, twin hulls are, are very efficient, and multi-hulls in general are very efficient. And that's because over the waterline, um, your width, width of the waterline to the length of the waterline, that ratio is really critical to how efficient your fuel is. So when you have two hulls basically moving in parallel, um, the, the vessel is more stable, and it gives you much more efficient <laughs> fuel economy um, than you get with a monohull generally speaking. It's, uh, it's the, the ancient Polynesians traveled all over the, the Pacific Ocean from New Zealand all the way to South America and, and the, and the uh, west coast of the U.S. and of course to Hawaii uh, on twin hull canoes. So they've been around for a long, long time. And I can tell you the, the boat that I did, the power cap that I did, went from Honolulu to the island of Kauai twice. And that was actually, for me, one of the biggest accomplishments of my life because that same channel that I made her cross twice in a boat that I built and designed destroyed two of King Kamehameha's fleets and made him decide not to try and attack the island of Kauai. He just negotiated a, a peace with the, the king over there because that channel is really, really nasty. And my 22-foot catamaran made it over and made it back. He usually took about two days to fix it because it's, it's a pretty rough channel. But those twin hull boats are, are really efficient. So, so, Joe, tell us a little about, about your current project and what's going on in San Francisco there with your, your current project. 
Yeah, okay, Stan. So the current project um, is called the Water Go Round. That's a, it's also a catamaran. It's 84 passenger, 70 foot long. Um, that's, I'm not sure what you have on the screen now, but it's uh, the blue one instead of the red and white one. <clears throat> um, this project is being funded partly by the California Air Resources Board um, Climate Mitigation Fund, where they're giving us uh, a grant that we applied for last year. Uh, the purpose is to demonstrate whether or not hydrogen fuel cell technology works on the water. And that is uh, primarily directed at harbor craft to clean the air in, at California harbors. So um, the vessel is um, as I mentioned, a catamaran, it has hydrogen tanks, um, gaseous hydrogen up on the top deck. The passengers are in a cabin which has uh, wraparound windows for high visibility. And then the fuel cells are um, aft in, on the main deck. Uh, we have 360 kilowatts of hydrogenic fuel cells. And then in the holes, we actually have 100 kilowatt hours of lithium on batteries as well. It's a twin shaft, so each hole has a 300 kilowatt electric motor. Um, when we combine the power from the fuel cells and the batteries for full power out of both shafts, we can get up to 22 knots. Oh, wow, that's pretty impressive. And, and so that hydrogen storage you have um, with that power setup, uh, what's the estimated range or duration time that you can, that you can drive with one fill-up of hydrogen? And what, what pressure do you put it in at? Yeah, so the pressure on these tanks, these are these are pretty large tanks, two feet in diameter and, and about 20 feet long. Um, it's, so it's 250 bar. Um, and then depending on how you run the boat, you know, you gave really good explanations earlier about the just amount of power and energy it takes to put a, push a boat through the water. Um, so depending on how you run it, at high speeds you use a lot more energy per mile than at low speeds. Um, we can run for a day, uh, sorry, two or three days at low speed, say around 10 knots. And if we're running high speed all day, um, we'll refuel every day. And you said that the fuel cells are actually, are they above, uh, above deck or above the, uh, the hulls? On the, and how are they protected from the elements? So there's a, that's correct. They're on the main deck just aft of the passenger cabin. And they're in a dedicated fuel cell room um, where we have uh, filtered air that gets in, so it keeps any of the, you know, salt and humidity out uh, from any of the electronics. Um, so it, it's got a dedicated room in the aft. We, again, we could we could have we have the space, and we could have put everything down in the hold, uh, but just from doing the first one, we wanted to make it uh, as easy as possible from many different ways. So this was the choice for this boat. Yeah, that makes maintenance a whole lot easier. And I know my son has uh, twin diesels in his fishing boat. And when it comes to doing maintenance on twin diesels below deck, um, my son's a pretty big guy. He's 6'2 <laughs> and almost 300 pounds. And ain't a whole lot of room for him to squirm around down there working on engines. So, yeah, I'd say putting him up there it makes That's a lot right. easier to work on him. And, um, and, you know, I know that we learned from the, the um, Sandia project with Young Brothers that, you know, the corro corrosion on the ocean is is something to be reckoned with, and you know we the one thing about um, the fuel cells are they do have I don't want to call it sensitive um, electronic components, but you certainly don't want to not protect your electronics in a fuel cell system. You're using electric motors to drive your props, and your fuel cell <clears throat> has to be breathing pretty much contamination free air. And, um, and be protecting the circuits and stuff from all the salt air exposure that you get on the ocean. And I can tell you that in San Francisco Bay, it may not be too bad most of the time, but here in Hawaii, holy mackerel. It, it, almost any boat that spends more than 30 seconds outside the harbor is getting pummeled by 15 to 20 knots of wind and four to six foot seas and splashing uh, salt air all over. So um, how, are, how are you filtering that air? Is it got multi-filter layers or uh, is there actually dedicated air conditioning around your fuel cells? Yeah, that's a good question, Stan, and it kind of points back actually to 
the first thing you mentioned, the first project we did in Hawaii with the container, because we learned a lot of lessons from putting fuel cells in the marine environment and a challenging one in Hawaii from that project that we're still using today and have applied to this vessel. Um, so we, there, there's a multi-stage filter system where we bring air uh, from the outside into the room that gets, like I said, the humidity and salt gets knocked out. Um, so the, the room air is dry and clean. And then we have another set of filters for the air that goes into the fuel cell for the reaction um, to eliminate, eliminate any kind of contamination or chemicals that might be in the air. Um, one example would be if this vessel is sitting next to another one that's running regular old diesel and all the diesel fumes are coming off of that vessel, we don't want that to get into the fuel cells. So we have that second set of filters to knock out anything like that. And do, do those uh, diesel vessels, do they put out any sulfur if they're using high sulfur fuel or is that pretty well knocked down by the emissions control systems on those diesel boats? Oh no, all, all the sulfur goes right through. So yeah, the, it, you know, they, they might have particulate filters on there or something like that to capture some of the particles, but sulfur in is sulfur out. And that's not good for fuel cells, I know that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, um, you know, you've got a really great project and we're really excited to see it come, up, come to fruition. When do you plan to start construction on this vessel over there in San Francisco? Uh, we already did. So oh. we laid the keel. We had a big ceremony for that. A lot of fun um, back in November, and then construction really started in earnest uh, at the beginning of February. So we've got we've got pieces <laughs> Great. To put together. That's awesome. Yeah, I, uh, we're we're about ready to wrap up, but there's one more question I had to ask you. You know, fuel cells do put off some heat, and I know in San Francisco in the winter time it can get a little bit chilly around that bay. Do you use the heat for um, heating the vessel as well? Uh, we, we've talked about that many times, and we haven't settled on how we're going to do that yet. Um, but there's a perfect opportunity there to use the heat from the fuel cell to heat the cabin. Okay. Absolutely. Great. Well, believe it or not, Joe, we've pretty much blasted through 30 minutes, and it just doesn't seem like enough time to talk about this. And I have almost as much passion for boats as I do for hydrogen. So um, I could always just keep talking yeah, to you for hours. Perfect mix. Yeah. I'll have to come to California sometime and check out your project and, uh, and look it over. Hey, we're gonna, it's going to be on the water in September, Stan. So come on up and take a ride. I will. I'll, I'll be there. Trust me. Okay, Joe, thanks for being on the show today. And to all the viewers out there, thanks for joining us. Thanks to Robert and Cindy in the studio for making all the magic happen with all the images and everything. And uh, we'll see you next week on Stan Energy Man. Aloha.